Hello everyone, I'm very excited to be here with you today. We'll be looking at some of the most important aspects of the new oral motor exam. I'll show you some exercises that I believe might be quite useful when preparing the students for the new oral motor exam. I'll show you some statistics, I'll share with you an idea which is called divergent thinking, and I guess this is the key to a student's success. So let's move on. Okay, I'm going to send three messages to you today. The first one is that the new oral mature exam requires a relatively new approach. If you want your students to be successful with the new oral mature exam, you need to apply some different strategies. New mature solutions as a book meets the new requirements, and if you remember these two, they will definitely contribute to your student's success. Very simple, three messages. I'm going to use uh, examples from these books, New Horizons 1, Oxford Petitorium, New Matura Solutions, probably the most important thing here, and exam builder. Let's have a look at some statistics. I was really surprised, no, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised to see that 81% of students decided to choose English as the major language. German came second with 13.7, and the other languages virtually do not exist. This pie chart presents the number of students who failed exams. 42% mathematics and 31% which was quite surprising to me and as many as 10% of students actually failed their oral exams. And since 81% of students chose English, we might say that these figures actually refer to English students, so to speak. And this one, this is the last one, presents the average scores. So the average score, basic level Matura, 69.4, and extended 75.4. Look at Russian. The average score for the extended level was 83%. Because I'm a university teacher, I have to negotiate the very thing called exams. The new Matura is just another exam. My students say, we don't believe that it's a good idea to exam anybody. Because they say, we can't demonstrate our skills under pressure. So then I use this quotation, I love it. Everything in life, including marriage, is done under pressure. So there's no discussion, okay? You need to take the exam. Let's have a look at the overall structure of the new oral motor exam. The first stage is called, which is a kind of introductory conversation. And it is supposed to put your students at ease. Your students get some questions general questions, and they're supposed to answer them. Then task one, it's a role play. And I think you're all familiar with this kind of exercise, and it's not really a novelty here. We've been doing it for quite a long time. Task two, an illustration, a picture, a photograph. So the student is supposed to describe the photograph and then answer three questions. And finally, task three, which is the stimulating material and then two questions. You have to keep in mind that your students, after choosing the set, will get no time at all to think about the whole material, which is quite difficult, especially for basic level students. And that's another thing. All of your students will take the same exam, irrespective of the level. So you'll have your basic level students and extended level students taking the same exam. Okay, let's have a look at the areas of assessment. Which of these do you think matches most? Which of these do you think will give your student most points? Exactly. So it will give them 18 points out of 30, which I think is crucial here. All the other things are substantially less important than communication skills. So let's put aside the other things for a while, we'll come back to them later on, and let's have a look at communication skills. And this is the definition. Stający powinien odnieść się do wszystkich wskazanych elementów zadania, ale również rozwinąć swoją wypowiedź dotyczącą każdego z nich. So, we might say that your students will be required to provide extended sentences. Okay, so let's do it. As I was saying, I'm a university teacher. I teach English to philosophy students, sociology students, you name it. So I had this idea to test the new oral motura exam with them. They've already passed the mature exam, so I thought they were in a very good position to compare these two. And in a minute, you will see their reaction to the new oral mature exam. Good morning. My name is Radek Szczanowski, and this is my colleague, Eva Palczak. 
What's your name? The student says, Piotr Bulka. Thank you, choose one set and give it to me. In this part of the exam, I'm going to ask you some questions. Can we start? Well, I chose, there was just three sets of questions. So I chose one of the sets, and I asked my, one of my students the first question. What do you like about the place where you live? And that was his reaction. <laughs> he told me, I know what I don't like about the place where I live, but not necessarily what I like. Okay, I didn't get miscarriage at that point, I carried on. Task one, about three minutes. Przebywając za granicą doznałeś kontuzji w czasie zajęć sportowych, jesteś u lekarza, poniżej podane są cztery kwestie, które musisz omówić w rozmowie z egzaminującym. Okoliczności zdarzenia, objawy, e, zalecenia i następna wizyta, wpływ kontuzji na twoje najbliższe plany. So when I reach that stage, this is what happened. Ok, task two, four minutes. Look at the photograph. Describe the picture. Po upływie około 10 sekund, proszę, jeśli to konieczne, zapytać. Can you start now? Ok? Can you imagine your students getting 10 seconds to think about the photograph and then they're supposed to, to start describing the picture? 10 seconds and no time at the very beginning of the exam. Then the students will get one of these questions. For example, tell me about a sports event in which you or your friends took part. Can you guess what the next slide is like? Yeah, you were right. Ok, and task 3. The most challenging one, five minutes. Your student will get three, four photographs and a task. In this case, there are three kinds of restaurants. Now, the student is supposed to choose one and take his or her family to dinner. Imagine that you have a very good student here. He goes for picture number two and says something like, OK, I fancy the idea of having a meal underwater and watching the fish before they get on my plate. Can I go now? No. You have to explain why you rejected the other two. Okay, so we have a very good student here, so he does it as well. Can I go now? No. You have some other questions. Two of them, actually. Look at the first one. Is the way we eat as important as what we eat? Yes, you were right, thinking that that's going to be the next slide. Why do you think it was so difficult for my university students? I asked them. And this is what they told me. We have accustomed our students to believe that there's only one correct answer and it's in the key. They've got 10 seconds, they've got an idea, but then they start thinking, is it the right idea? Is it the thing that the teacher, the examiner, actually has got in his or her key? Probably not, that's a stupid idea, so I'm not going to use it. I need to think of something else, but I've got only four seconds left. So then they panic. Our students are intelligent, believe it or not. They have the flippers, they have the swimming masks, and they want to swim in the sea. But what we're offering them is just this little rubber called the key. And this awareness paralyzes them. So that's why next time you test your students, I want you to keep in mind this lovely quotation. If a man doesn't keep pace with his companions, meaning provides an answer which is not in the key, perhaps it is because he hears a different drama. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. And I think this is very important if you want your students to be successful with the new for example. They can't be afraid of coming up with their own ideas. People see reality in many different ways. Believe me, this one is not in the key. But isn't it artistic? Isn't it creative? And now, this is the moment when divergent thinking comes into play. Divergent thinking is defined as the ability to generate many different ideas about a topic in a short period of time, like 10 seconds. So I truly, I really believe we need to develop this capacity if we want the students to be successful. I had to throw this one in because it's an excellent example of divergent thinking, actually. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's a mathematics test for seven-year-olds. Jest siedem krasnoludków, siedem szkoleń mleka i sześć ogórków. Czego jeden krasno nie dostanie? Again, it's not in the key, right? So imagine you've got this seven-year-old girl spending a lot of time with her granny, telling her, 
remember, if you have a cucumber, never drink milk, right? So that what comes to the mind in the first place. So this is an excellent example. It's, it's a correct answer, definitely, but it's not in the key. But she doesn't know it yet, because she's only seven years old. I, I think we need to educate our students for the future. We don't know what the future holds. The future looks really complicated. If we don't know what to do about it, if we haven't got the proper tools to deal with the future, things look like this. But in fact, can you have found the way out? It's, it's like here, right? <laughs> things get much simpler if you have the proper tools. And uh, in this case, I think divergent thinking is the best tool. The future is unpredictable. The questions that your students are going to get taking the mature exams are unpredictable as well. Let's have a look at some other examples of divergent thinking if you're still not convinced that this is the best way to approach the exam. There is this company and they sell sheets of paper. They call it origami Christmas tree ball for beginners. All you have to do is crumple the paper and you put a nice Christmas decoration. Ingenious. It's a paper clip. How many uses for a paper clip can you think of? I can tell you. An average person can come up with about 10 to 15 uses for a paper clip. If you're really good at this, you can give about 200. Like, for example, a necklace or a hanger. And this is scientific stuff. There is this book, Breakpoint and Beyond, written by George Land and Beth Jarman. What they did, they tested 1,500 people on divergent thinking. They set a particular level of answers which qualified the objects of the experiment as geniuses. So once you scored a particular score, then you were considered to be a genius. And they looked at different age groups. So first they looked at three to five year olds. Now, how many of them do you think turned out to be geniuses? Give me a percentage. 98% of children at the age 3 to 5 were considered to be geniuses. Then, 8 to 10 year olds, give me the percentage. 32%. Okay, now 13 to 15 year olds. 10%. And now let's have a look at ourselves, ladies and gentlemen. 25 plus. What's the percentage? 2%. Do you find it? reasonable, like a three or five year old is a genius and then at the age of 25 is like... School fields. Alrighty. Where do you work by the way? <laughs> okay, I, I think this uh, particular video clip explains a lot. You're going to see a boy. He's five years old and he's given two rules and on the basis of these two rules he's asked a question and he's supposed to provide the answer. Okay. It says, if you hit a glass with a hammer, the glass will break. Okay, if you hit a glass with a hammer, the glass will break. The boy says, <laughs> I knew that. Here comes rule number two. And then this one says, Don hit a glass with a hammer. <laughs> so what happened to the glass? Okay, so Don hit a glass with a hammer. The boy says, I knew that too. So what happened to the glass? The, the question was in the past tense. So the boy said, It broke. It broke. Why did it break? Because the hammer is hard. Okay, the glass broke because the hammer is hard. Doesn't make sense to you. It should, because he's a genius, right? <laughs> now he gets two more rules. If you hit a glass with a feather, the glass will break. If you hit a glass with a feather, the glass will break. <laughs> no, it won't. Of course not. Here comes the second rule. And this is the second rule. Don hit a glass with a feather. What happened to the glass? Nothing. Nothing happened. Why didn't anything happen? Because the feather was soft. Okay, nothing happened because the feather is soft, of course. Now we're going to see a girl. She's 15 years old. <laughs> She's been going to school for a while. We don't really need to see the, the rest of the video. We know what kind of things happen. But we're going to see it anyway. Okay? So here is this girl. First one says, if you hit a glass with a feather, the glass will break. Do you remember the boy's reaction? The boy's reaction was, no. But the, boy, the girl's reaction is, oh yes. And 
second one, Don hit a glass with a feather. What happened to the glass? Now she's doing the thinking. <laughs> and of course, what she's going to say is... It broke. It broke. So you have already answered the question. Um, I think the girl is excessively intelligent. And she's been used to receiving uh, she, she has been actually inundated with rules and formulas that she didn't understand. But she knew how to survive. She followed these rules and she provided the expected answers. That was her strategy. But unfortunately, this strategy will not work when dealing with the new oral motor exam. Just because of the fact that the students will get very little time to provide the answers. And um, they can't keep thinking about, is it the right answer? They must come up with the ideas immediately. So that's why we need to develop divergent thinking. There are two stages to develop this particular capacity. The first one is called self-analysis. You encourage your students to spend about 10 minutes asking these questions to themselves. How do I spend my time? What are my activities during a normal day? What do I know about? What are my areas of expertise? What am I studying in school? What do I like? Uh, what are my interests? What bothers me? What would I like to change in my world or life? What are my strongest beliefs, values, and philosophies? Do you think these questions are easy? Now, the second thing is topic analysis. This one is a bit more tedious, I think. So we ask your students to look at these questions when, when, they get a, when they get a task. So instead of using something, they use a particular question. Like, for example, they're supposed to say something about eating out. So the first question is, how would you describe eating out? What are the causes of eating out? What are the effects of eating out? What is important about eating out? The fifth one is particularly helpful, I think. What are the smaller parts that comprise eating out? Sometimes your students get a question and they think it's too complicated. They can't talk about it because they don't really understand the whole of it. But if they look at some of the details, they might be able to produce an answer. How has eating out changed? What is known or unknown about eating out? So let's have a look at this question. I think you should remember this one. What are the smaller parts that comprise something? eating out or anything else. And here's an example. Did you know what studying stands for? <laughs> studying is student plus dive. And if your students actually approach the question from that perspective, they might be able to have some interesting ideas immediately. But we need to develop this kind of capacity. Okay, now I'm going to show you some of the exercises that I think are very much connected with divergent thinking. And at least they help you develop this capacity. So here's the first one. Decide which three of the crimes in exercise two are the most serious and why. Tell the class which crimes you have chosen. So I think you should pay special attention to these exercises that require your students to, to give their own opinions as quickly as possible. Imagine one bad thing that happened yesterday and write it down. Look at the examples to help you. The dog chewed my trainer, my brother broke my iPad, my mom burnt my my. Yeah. Right. Their personal experience. Or this one. Take it in turns around the class to repeat the whole sentence and add your idea from exercise 7. Remember to use the past perfect. When I got home yesterday, the dog had chewed my trainer and my brother had broken my iPad. And then, within 10 seconds, the rest of the sentence. You need to ask your students intriguing questions, like for example this one. Do you think it's ever okay to steal? Give reasons and examples. I think you have a lot of students in your class who are criminals because they download things from the internet, for example, and some of them might say, well, of course, it's okay to steal sometimes. Now, one of the biggest problems, I guess, is the fact that there's an, only one exam for everyone. So, do you think that the examiners will be able to, to avoid comparing students representing different, different levels of English? I think this is going to be very difficult because they're going to deal with very poor students and very strong students at the same time. So there are different problems. The first one is vocabulary, of course. So now I'm going to test you on medical vocabulary. That's a very good way to introduce some vocabulary. What comes up to eye? Eyeballs? These are supposed to be some kind of medicine, like. Eye drops, very good. Le cough? That's a very good answer, but it's not in the key, sorry. <laughs> Tablets and? Yeah. Very good. Bananas? Yeah. Very good. Herbal? Yeah. Herbal medicine, herbal tea. 
Very good answer, but it's not in the key. There are remedies. How does it feel when the answer is not in the key? It's almost true. Last one. And very good answer, but it's not in the key. An injection. And the last one? I think, no, if you have lozenges, okay. If you have a very poor student, a hopeless case, I think you can teach him or her 10 or 15 words that might seem a bit more sophisticated to impress the examiners. And I think lozenges actually count as something more sophisticated. If you teach vocabulary, always teach vocabulary in context. It helps when it comes to dealing with unexpected questions as well. So do you recognize this guy? Thank you. I'm a walking economy. My hair is in full bloom. My stomach is a victim of regular workout. Thank you very much. And both of these together are putting me into a deep pleasure. Okay, 10 kilograms later. Think in terms of economy, okay? I'm a walking economy. My hair is in recession. My stomach is a victim of inflation. Like you inflate rubber toys, for example. And both of these together are putting me into a deep depression. This time it's depression. You see, context is quite powerful, and at least when those bad things come into play. The next problem in the conversation is drama. Drama is crucial. Uh, for this task, the student was supposed to correct the sentence. The girl was extraordinarily intelligent, and this is the correction. <laughs> There are two problems with this sentence. One of them is not grammatical, really. But we're going to have a look at grammar. In an average course book, you have this attitude to speaking. They put together vocabulary and speaking. But what we did in OEP was the idea to put grammar and speaking together. Because lack of grammar hampers communication. Sometimes it makes it impossible. So your students will get, this one comes probably from Pertorio. Uh, your students um, get a, uh, an exercise, which is you know, basically a grammar exercise, it's all about prepositions, but at the same time, they are supposed to describe the picture. Why do you think the student looks upset? So the primary objective is to practice prepositions, so they fill in the gaps, but then they can use some of the ideas to describe the picture. And this is really important, because now they know that grammar is not only this tedious drill, but it's got some kind of you know, practical applications when approaching uh, the oral exam as well. Taking an exam is just like going to war. So in OEP books, you will find a lot of useful advice how to approach the exam. For example, pytanie examinującego nie jesteś w stanie przewidzieć, może się jednak wyćwiczyć szybkie reakcje na zadawane pytania. So let's have a look at some pieces of advice that your students will find in OEP books. For example, that's these speaking some training. Utrzymuj kontakt wzrokowy z egzaminującym i mów wyraźnie. Jeśli egzaminujący nie będzie mógł Cię zrozumieć, nie otrzymasz punktów za to zadanie. My university students sometimes do it. They just say something like, oh, yesterday I went to the <coughs> and we had a very good time. What is it that examiners want? We also give our students the information what the exam examiners are looking for. Zdający swobodnie wypowiada się na tematy proste i złożone, formując wypowiedź na tematy złożone, rzadko stosuje słowa oraz struktury o wysokim stopniu pospolitości, takie jak miły, interesujący, fajny. New Horizons 1. Study strategy. Rozbudowane odpowiedzi. Staraj się odpowiadać wyczerpująco na zadane pytania, jeśli możesz udziel dodatkowych informacji. Where did you go in your gap year? I went to China. I decided to go to China because I'm very interested in Chinese culture. Yes. Czy w swoim opisie ilustracji zdający skupił się przede wszystkim na elementach służących wyrażaniu jej głównej myśli, czy zachował logiczny porządek wypowiedzi? Tak, nie. Okay? This information is actually in OEP books. It's available for your students, they can refer to it while, while preparing for the exam. Okay, so in a nutshell, to summarize, I think what you should remember after today's presentation is that you should think outside the box, and this is what OEP does all the time to help you. Aha, jeszcze. Po zakończeniu egzaminu podziękuj i pożegnaj się z komisją egzaminacyjną. Dziękuję bardzo za ten egzamin. Mam nadzieję, że zobaczymy się jeszcze kiedyś. Thank you very much. Thank you.